Let's go. All right, everybody. It's the Jerry Metcalf podcast. We're top real estate agents. Tell how they do it. And we have on the show, Daniel Hyder in Washington, D.C., just so you guys know, we've, you've been on a few episodes before, but I want to give you an update. For the third year in a row, Daniel is number one with Sotheby's International Realty. He is, for two years, the number one team and agent, I think, in sales volume in the capital region. You're also a top 100 Sotheby's International Realty associate. We're talking global here. You have three and a half million followers on t- TikTok. Just put real estate in TikTok and it pops up and you guys have also just listed i think it's the blaine mansion which is a really famous listing in washington dc that's who we're talking to today daniel welcome thank you for that introduction i should say that uh we've been number one at ttr sotheby's international realty for three years so our our washington franchise which is in dc maryland and virginia um, and our team uh, has been fortunate to, to, to have that that title, but uh, hopefully, number one, it's it's Sotheby's in the world one day. We'll we'll, we'll see. You're top you're top 100 already, so you're not, you're doing all right. Um, so tell us a little bit. We've we've been on we've done this before quite a few times, and we've talked a lot about you know you came in and you. I think they've called you the wonder kid in real estate because at a very young age you were selling you know, five, 10, 15, 20, $50 million properties. And you were doing that in your twenties. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, there was some article that came out. I think it was around the time that I, uh, listed Mike Tyson's former estate in uh, Bethesda that I uh, said that I was the wonder kind, uh, which is a German word for, you know, like the phenomenal young person that's, you know, I guess doing great things, which was a nice, nice moniker to have at the time. I'm, I'm now 36. So I don't know how much of a wonder kind I am, but, uh, you know, get, get, getting up there now, Jerry. Well, I'm ahead of you. I'm ahead of you, Daniel, but I'm <laughs> going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you about how much, um, maybe no one should... will ever know it. Cause look at how gorgeous you are. Thank you. I like to think so, but don't we all as women, if we're smart, we just own it. Um, so like the Mike Tyson mansion, we talked a little about that before, but just for a fun start, how do you pull that off to get that as a listing? Well, um, you know, that listing came, uh, right off of the heels of a listing that I was referred, um, just down the street, <clears throat> which we sold privately for, you know, a, a record breaking number. I think it was close to $7 million at the time in record time. Um, you know, again, it hadn't been publicly listed and, uh, Mike Tyson's, uh, ex-wife, uh, reached out and, uh, and said, Hey, you know, I'm considering putting the house on the market and I wanted to talk to you. You got such a great result at the other property. How did you do it? And of course, you know, the Tyson estate had been, you know, a storied house in Montgomery County for everyone. Everybody would point to it. It was on the uh, uh, Congressional Country Club um, fairway. And so people would always play golf and say, you know, that that was Mike Tyson's house. And um, so it, it had a lot of, uh, you know, kind of energy around it. And so uh, when she was considering putting the house on the market, you know, she was talking to absolutely everybody. All the big listing agents were there. Um, and so... What she really connected to me on was on my website, danielhyder.com, I created this sort of ethos video, which essentially more or less articulates uh, kind of what a, uh, you know, what the process kind of means to us and our team and a little bit about kind of me and more of an esoteric standpoint. You know, it's the story of this uh, kind of underdog uh, boxer who happens to be a client, you'll have to go and check it out. But the long story or the short of it is, um, that it involves, uh, a boxer. My grandfather was, uh, a, a boxer and in the Marine Corps and is in the DC boxing hall of fame. And so she watched the video. It was very connected to that. You know, I was able to draw some comparisons between being a fighter and being kind of the underdog at the time, certainly in the market with not having, you know, the, the big premier, you know, listings of the time, except for that one that was under my belt. So, um, you know, I put my be- best foot forward and, uh, you know, my goodness, uh, that listing, I probably spent more time and resources, um, both human resources and, you know, capital resources in, in selling, uh, 
um, of any listing that I that I probably have ever sold in my career. I mean, we did extensive IP address targeting. We did unbelievable, you know, marketing campaigns, uh, print advertising, digital, social media. Um, and of course, you know, when you have a name like, you know, Mike Tyson, it certainly helped. Mike Tyson actually did a, a little video for us to introduce the property, which was really cool. So he participated in the, the sales event. Um, and, you know, that really helped me kind of um, attract a lot of attention in that neck of the woods, in that market. Um, and, you know, of course, once you get the attention, uh, the name of the game is keeping it. So, uh, we've done a good job at, at doing that. Of course, that was right around the start of the pandemic, which the market was, you know, really on a tear. So that certainly helped us, uh, and it's, you know, helped snowball into other listing opportunities and certainly given us a, a, a breadth of experience that, um, has positioned us well for the listings that we currently have. What I hear is three things. You got synergy. You know, connect work well, actually cr connection and synergy to create this listing. You got this listing, you spent more income and resources and in investing in it and you got synergy. You know, a lot of times like you hear about somebody like Mike Tyson, but Mike Tyson doesn't get involved. Well, you know, I think what a lot of real estate agents that, that, that at least have, I've seen that have come before me um, have done has been, you know, and again, this is just my perspective, but what I've realized in my in my career uh, is that a lot of times real estate agents are really afraid to tell their clients what they actually need to do to make a meaningful story. And look, I live in Washington, DC. This is not Vegas or LA or Miami where people, you know, like the additional level of media exposure. People, you know, do everything they can to hide from uh, the press and, um, you know, that type of public exposure. But I knew that it'd be very, very important to have the seller directly involved in telling the story from the onset so that we could control the narrative and, you know, understanding how media works. If you, you know, I was, I have a, you know, a, a good relationship with the Wall Street Journal and I reached out to Kathy Clark and I said, Kathy, you know, this would be a really spectacular home to feature. I told her a little bit about it. You know, we were able to get the seller to participate. The Wall Street Journal broke the story after they did a phenomenal interview. And, you know, they were telling stories about their family and they told a story about how, you know, Mike Tyson had this, you know, white Bengal tiger that got loose on the golf course. And the security guard of the golf cart was driving around trying to find a loose Bengal tiger on congressional, you know, you know, country. That is not right. Like what a story. You know, I mean, well, I mean, it's it, it, it's 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 illustrious, right? I mean, it's it's a it's definitely an attention grabber, and what that allowed you know us to do is again amplify the attention, but do it in a way that was exciting and that paid you know the property respect. You know, instead of you know, any time that you're coming on the market in Washington with a property that's you know worth you know valued over you know seven million dollars or so. The press is going to write a story about it, right? And it's yeah. better that that you advise your clients oh, to control the narrative from the onset, you know, than have somebody who doesn't know anything about the property just mash up what they think they know. Yeah. All of a sudden, that becomes a leading story. So, you know, I think directing our clients to you know to making sure that they are in the seat of control when it comes mm -hmm. to telling the story about the house is a really smart one. And you know, we we did that. So it was about, you know, connection and really synergy. Once you got the synergy with the team, the investment, what needed to happen, then that puts you in a position to create the, the attention and it was the right kind of attention. And you said something really powerful there. You said, you know, once we get got the attention, then it was about try what you said it was it's about keeping that moving forward, the traction. Synergy, get the attention the right kind, which can be tricky with somebody like Mike Tyson because Mike Tyson's got quite the history, even though he's very much transformed in his character. For those of you who don't know about him, I actually think I have his bio in here and I don't see it, but I read, did you read his bio? He's done some extraordinary things. So I mean, good. He, he, and they get that traction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's definitely somebody who, you know, has gone through a lot in his life and cool. achieved yeah. stardom that, you know, only a very few amount of people in this world will ever experience. And that in and of itself must be, you know, so troubling to somebody who came from absolutely nothing, who's literally and figuratively a fighter, 
you know, so, you know, everybody deserves a second chance. He's, he's and he, if you ever, that he's so humble and so grounded to listen to him now in his bio, it's like, Mike, we didn't need to know all of that. Like if anybody wanted to, that's how honest he is in that book. And I'll share this with the, with the um, post in the show notes that we post for the show, but the, the transparency of him is just unbelievable. Now we're going to go back in real estate and talk about this traction that you've created in your business. But first, for everybody who is as curious as I am, I'm sure you are. What is it like working with, like, what's he like working with him? Well, you know, to, to, to be super clear, his ex-wife was really my main point of contact. Um, and I, I, you know, through that, I got to meet, you know, uh, a lot of their family, um, you know, his, his daughter and his son, um, and, and they're all just wonderful, sweet people. You know, his ex-wife, uh, is I, I, frankly, I'm, I, to this day, I'm still very connected to her. She has the same birthday as my mom. She's a Pisces. She's very sweet you know, uh, was totally invested in her kid's education. You know, I remember one of the first stories that she told me when, when she was giving me a, a tour of the, the, the estate was this specific room where she installed these cameras and there was this, you know, desk and that was the homework room. And that's where she made sure, you know, she was on top of them on their studies. And, you know, she, uh, she's a doctor and on the board of Georgetown and, uh, you know, really fascinating, um, story. And her brother is a is a very big politician uh, locally here um, in the Washington area. Uh, and and so yeah, I mean, look. At the end of the day, no matter what, we're serving people. No matter what the political affiliation or their you know their brand is, whether you like them or you don't like them, the role is to show up and to serve the client. Right. I'm not like one of these people that's not going to bake a birthday cake for a gay person or, you know, refuse to work with somebody because they're a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I sell houses. And so, you know, people come to us from all walks of life, uh, needing great service. And, you know, that's what we intend to give everyone. So it was a, 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 a absolute, um, you know, honor to work with them. Uh, and we got the job done, right. They've become, you know, good friends and, and allies and advocates of my business. And I couldn't be, you know, more grateful for that. So in your business, when you create traction, you know, something I see you do, I don't know if it's natural or not, but anybody who's heard, heard me talk about Daniel, here's what I say about you. Like, you know, when you get on the phone or you get a call with Daniel, this is what you get. Jerry, like I'm you, tell me about you. Like all you want to know is just take that person in and it's just that engagement and then maintaining. You said you, you get that and you keep that traction. That's my experience with you. Where it's just like, you just can't not love Daniel Hyder. And what, what's your version of that? You know, my version of that is, I think if you live your life, you know, generally, uh, generally with the principle that, you know, making the other person feel valued and heard and feel important. Um, if that can be the main fundamental of everything that you do in your life and your business, you're going to have a really happy one. You're going to have mm -hmm. a lot of advocates. You're going to have a lot of people that want to root for you, that want to give you those opportunities that maybe historically would have gone to, you know, the old guard real estate agent in the neighborhood. You know, the name of the game is treating people well and delivering on promises that you make. And, mm -hmm. you know, in that moment, you know, I kind of felt like a little like David and Goliath, right? You know, here I am, this young 20 something, you know, agent with no experience in that neck of the woods uh, to that point, very limited, I should say. And, you know, David had to do some David versus Goliath shit, right? I mean, like, so, you know, the way that I, the way that I think about that is, you know, I want to be able to take care of people in a way that's unforgettable. And I love that Maya Angelou quote, you know, it may sound corny, but I really actually believe this, you know, is that people will forget what you say, people will forget what you do, but they'll never forget the way that you make them feel. And so, you know, leveling with people, grabbing folks when they're in a moment of, you know, anxiety, or, you know, maybe a, a neighbor is telling them something to the contrary of what you're telling them, making sure that you're keeping the shit going, making sure that you're constantly reaffirming your value, making sure that you're constantly directing all of your efforts 
towards your client and the way that they feel about the interactions that they have with you and their confidence in the work that you're doing is really all that matters. You know, I, I can tell you that I did not get here today because I have the biggest social media following in the world, but I did get here. Even though you do. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I know Ryan Serhant likes to say that he's the most followed brand in the world, but I think he's got to do some number crunching. Um, uh, you know, look, I, I think it's really important to just center the universe around the people that give you opportunities as a real estate agent, you know, I mean, and and be, being obsessed, constantly thinking of clever things to, you know, show the people that are giving you these unbelievable opportunities that you care about them, that you value um, the opportunity, you know, there's so much um, online, uh, you know, that 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 I'm watching, you know, now with with agents and kind of social media trends where it seems to be <clears throat> all kind of them focused. You know, mm -hmm. this is how you make, you know, you know, to look like an entrepreneur, to pose in front of a sexy car, or you know, to to kind of what? Oh, get yeah. this vibe, you know, and it's like the people that are really doing the, you know, the admirable, you know, lion share of, of the, of, of the business that gets the press, like the Tyson's estate, um, are the people that are intently focused on those relationships because you can, anyone can get one listing, right? Anyone can get one big listing, but I think it's very seldom that you find people that get those type of listings over and over and over and over and over again. That's what's thrilling to me. I, I never feel entitled to having a certain market share, you know, and I think that where a lot of folks have gotten tripped up, um, you know, specifically in my market is that I think they've rested on their laurels. I think a lot of these folks have done what historically, you know, um, the market, you know, uh, expected, which was show up, sign the listing paperwork, not really put together a big marketing plan, not really have a digital social media strategy and, you know, rest on the, the name that's, you know, kind of carried through the marketplace. And while that will get you somewhere, business, you know, begets business in real estate, you know, I think really, Jer, you know, what, what your folks want to listen to is that there is space for you, the underdog, there is space for, you know, the, the, the aspiring agent who wants to have those multi-million dollar, you know, transactions, if you are tenacious and you can make it all about those clients and getting in front of them and being genuine and, you know, delivering on a promise, it may put you in the hole a little bit. I mean, yeah. I, what well, I mean I by that is financially, right? I mean, it, there's it, a few things, center the universe around the people giving you opportunities. So I've gotten a lot of people coming to me that are not just the people who are breaking in, but the people who are there and it's getting there, it's getting broken into, which brings up an interesting topic. It's like, if you're losing market share, what is it that's losing you market share? And you said a few things. It's centering your, you center your universe around the people giving you opportunities. And then you said really caring about the people you serve. And then you said, deliver, on promises. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to set your clients expectations. I sent an email right before uh, I got on this uh, zoom chair to a globally known celebrity who I've just listed their house for $38 million. It will be the most expensive listing in DC um, right after the Blaine mansion that we, we have also just listed. Which we have got to talk about that a little bit, but go yes. ahead. Yeah. And you know, this person is, you know, on, on, you know, television all the time. And, uh, you know, I say who he is yet. I'm assuming. Not, are we not yet, okay. not yet? Not yet. Um, but you know, I said to him in the coming days, you can expect this, 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 and this for my office, you know, and I make sure to make sure that, you know, we're, we're executing on those things, those expectations that we set up. I'm making sure that, you know, the quality is flawless. I'm making sure that I'm communicating with him. Um, and you know, uh, my emails are beautifully written and that I'm giving timely responses and that we're on the ball with every interaction that we have never, ever, ever taking anything for granted. You know, I mean, it's, I think magic to, you know, realize in the moment of doing your job, which I was doing in writing just that email, how fortunate I am to be able to even correspond with somebody like this, that, you know, a, uh, 
a kid who you know did not graduate from college is advising one of the most important people you know on on television and and so you know those little realizations help me see the bigger picture you know and for me that is look i live my life through my work uh real estate has allowed me to meet the most extraordinary people and not just meet them, but really connect with them. You know, uh, I, I, I've seen the world. I've gotten to do unbelievable things through my work. And so, you know, I guess for me, I'm lucky because I am so obsessed and so passionate about what I do. Um, but just keeping things in perspective, uh, you know, never. Which is a lot more challenging, I think, than people know. You, you see people hit success. It's so easy to get off kilter on perspective because you're used to one perspective and your life changes and there's a new one and you've got to reground and re it's almost like you've got to there's a whole new frame of reference in your world and the other people's worlds who you're serving Absolutely. and you have at a young age i mean you're in your 30s now okay I <laughs> my hair I'm over, i've got 11 years on you we'll leave it at that but i remember when you're i amazing did, thank you i need your dermatologist immediately I turned, I'll send you, I'll give you all kinds of tips. I want to write a blog just on that mm -hmm. stuff. I love that stuff. So I turned 40 and I thought, I'm like an adult now. Like I like realized that when I turned 40, I literally remember on my birthday, I was like, like, I'm not in my, like in my thirties, I was in my twenties, but I turned 40 and I'm like, like, I'm, I'm like a grown up. Like I'm not in my twenties. That was what I thought. You know, <laughs> mindset is so important as you know, Jer. And, and, and I think that, you know, look, what you believe is your own individual reality. You know, it's exactly why, you know, if you look at the real estate industry, there are so many people having such a variety of different experiences. You've got people at the top that are killing it. You know, you've got the Nikki Fields of the world that are selling $140 million listings after $200 million listing, after a hundred million, after 50, after 70. You know, and then you've got then you've got folks that are just trying to get one rental client, right? And so, look, the mindset is what determines absolutely everything. It's the belief system. You know, if you keep telling yourself certain things, whether they are true or not, you know, or meaningful to someone else is completely irrelevant. If you believe them, that's the truth. And that's what's going to show up for you. You know, I'm just really fortunate that I have people in my life, um, you know, in my family and that I'm very close friends with who always kind of encouraged, you know, me to understand my own power in, in you know, and, and, and frankly, some of the early advice that I got, I can remember early on in my real estate career thinking as somebody was giving me advice, hmm, well, no, that, that may be true for you, but that's not true for me in my, in my mind, right? Like Daniel, it's going to take you five to seven years to, you know, become a real estate agent in this market with your name on a sign and to make any money. You're going to be, you know, in this mentee program for at least three years before you make any money. And I thought to myself, literally, as that information was being projected onto me by somebody who believed that and maybe was their life experience. And they had good intentions. Yes, absolutely. You know, your parents have good intentions. Your mentors have good intentions. But remember, most people are operating from their point of experience. And so, you know, in that moment, I'm just so thankful that I knew that that was their experience and that that didn't resonate with me and that I was going to do something different, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, you know, it, I'm so, so grateful for that mindset. And I, and if there's one thing that I constantly, you know, mention to my team is that, you know, you are what you believe and, you know, your mindset determines absolutely everything. You know, I, I do say to myself all the time that, you know, I am extraordinarily fortunate. I'm extraordinarily lucky. You know, I have the most amazing luck. Things just fall in my lap. Opportunities, people, you know, uh, connections, uh, you know, I, that is a fundamental belief that I have. And so, you know, the world shows up for me in a way that I feel that I'm deliberately creating. 
Well, you know what's interesting about that is that what you just said in so many ways is so powerful. You you talked about, you know, I number one, gratitude. In that gratitude, you said things just show up for me. Now, what's interesting is that some people think say things should show up for me. Now, another interesting thing is that belief system, things happen because of action. Sure. That belief system, when I, I know I know you and I see what you do and I see what a lot of other people do, their actions are drastically different. Your mm-hmm. actions are drastically different from most people's actions in general and specifically also in real estate. You know what though? It's only because they have not been confronted with, you know, uh, confronted and 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 haven't yet realized that you know their actions and their thoughts, you know, predicate everything in their lives, good or bad or otherwise. You know, and I think that when you make that connection, that hey, I'm in a depressive, downwards, downtrodden cycle. You know, I am being pessimistic, you know, that water cooler conversation that I'm having with the, you know, other agents that are in the office that are just sitting around and talking about the doom and gloom of the market and, you know, what the firm isn't doing for you or is doing for you is creating a cyclone of the same old, same old. And so what you have to do is be resolute. You have to be the David versus Goliath. And like I said, you got to do some David shit right? You got to throw the rock. You got to say, hell no, I'm not going to engage in that conversation. I'm not going to accept that this market is a bad market and that, you know, sales are going down and that, you know, oh my God, good luck if I ever find a buyer again. I'm not going to accept it. That may be true for you hypothetically, but it's not true for me. And I defeat, you know, I, I defy the odds and I win and I am lucky and I deserve it and I'm creating more. Well, here's the thing, because that mindset creates action. We've got to talk about David and Goliath for a minute, which you have. But have you read the book by Malcolm Gladwell or listened to the talk? Right. So Goliath was interesting. And you're you're telling the same story in the story. You know, so many people perceive it as Goliath. David was the underdog. But the reality was he wasn't. The reality in the story was they remember they presented in the armor. They said to you, you're going to have to do this and it's going to be five years. They presented him the armor to fight David and he said no. And some people read that as it was being humble. And other people would read that when you read between the lines like Malcolm Gladwell and he might correct me on this. But in that he said no, because that's not who I am. Not that he was above or below it, but he was a master. He was a master at slingshotting. The equivalent of being a master of that market knowledge, understanding of how to do what you do, you understand how to serve people, you understand how to learn the market, you understand how to hold a team accountable. And knowing those things, he knew what he knew and he needed to do who he was. And when he came down, Goliath just looked scary, but Goliath moved slowly. Goliath saw double vision. He thought that there were two sticks that he had, but it was only one. And so you've got a guy who's a master With the slingshot, the pebbles they used were the speed of a bullet. They could do it with the accuracy of a bullet. And it was the strength of a bullet for the stones they selected to use slingshots. And Goliath's down there getting shot in the head. Yeah. He just didn't know it because he looked big and scary. But at the end of the day, who was the real underdog? And it's owning your power. Until you own your power, you will be the underdog. Well, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, look, not to say that, you know, one person's opinion is, you know, good or bad or relevant or not relevant. I think that what I'm trying to make that the point I'm trying to make is that it's all out there for you to pick and choose and that, you know, it's not good or bad, you know, but, but, but I, I guess I like to think that I'm a little bit more conscious of, you know, what I'm attracting and, and I think that that's a really important thing to do. And when you st- when I when I use the term David versus Goliath, I'm using it in the more you know storied literal sense of you know the underdog. I'm using it in the sense of yeah. here comes this you know this this like little midget, and then this massive cyclops you know like giant, and you know go- goes into the arena and he defeats this big, big yeah Goliath right. And and so you know look, I I have looked 
at you know life in that sort of analogy but my goliath has never been an individual person goliath for me stands for getting out of my own way goliath stands for defeating the notions that I can't, or I shouldn't, or, you know, no, you, you, how are you going to have this conversation with this person when you've never sold anything in this neighborhood? Or, you know, how am I going to ask for that raise? Or, you know, how am I going to make this big leap and decide to hire my first assistant and pay her $50,000 a year when I'm trying to get my business off the ground? That's the Goliath metaphorically that I'm referring to. And how do you, no, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I, I think that, you know, look, these little battles that you create for yourself are those kind of David moments, right? Where you, you know, you win these little battles, like, you know, hey, whether it's getting up and going to the gym in the morning or, you know, actually making the phone calls to your past clients to say, hey, I was just driving past your house the other day and I thought about, you know, when we worked together, that was like, you know, three years ago, I saw that you, you know, have, have touched up the front, it looks so good. I just wanted to reach out and say, hey, and like, you know, I'd love to get together with you. You know, I mean, it's it's just doing the things that you know you need to do and the anxiety that comes into, and this is again, my my perspective, right? I I acknowledge that, when I don't do the inherent things that I know I need to do, because it's literally my nervous system telling me what to do every single day. When I don't make the calls, when I don't lead the team in, you know, in the manner that I had intended to, when I don't write the thoughtful email that I should have, when I don't send the gift that I knew that I should have, when I should have sent it, when I don't go to the gym, when I don't listen to, you know, more positive things and kind of get down in the muck and mire, that's when I feel the most amount of anxiety and the most discord from you know the feelings that 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 i want to experience every day the things that make me feel powerful and give me more of a platform and empower other people and help my clients and help my family and 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 so i just i try to stay connected to that feeling as much as i can you know i just mm. try to, and 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 that can be jerry that can be listening to an awesome song in the shower you know just to get my mind off of a subject. And then hopefully that will snowball into something more positive. You know, over the weekend, I'll give you a real time example. Over the weekend, you know, I I saw, I'm not gonna get into specifics, but I saw this, this person um, posted something on social media um, and it was aggravating. And they said something aggravating. And, you know, I thought to myself, like I was there on the beach, you know, laying with my boyfriend, enjoying the beautiful sun. And I'm like, God, like that, that just did not feel good, you know? And I, and I had like kind of been like, I can't believe that this person would do this and would say this. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I'm going to listen to some Bob Marley right now. I'm going to go in the ocean. I'm going to wash off this feeling. I will not allow this into my vortex. It does not belong here. It, it's not welcome here. You know, I'm going to say thank you for showing me this example of something that I don't want, because if I didn't have the examples of what I didn't want, it wouldn't feel so good to feel so good, you know? Oh, and so yeah. I try to get back on, 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 you know, on the path as, as quickly as possible. And I will tell you, that is something, Jerry, that I have learned over the years. I did not pop out of the womb, you know, with this mentality always. And I can tell you as I've gotten older and as my business has grown and I've had more interactions with people and more wins and more failures and more, 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 um, you know, I've come to know that the most important thing is to shift into a better feeling. That's the most simplistic um, way we can do it. Wow. Yeah. And shift into the more important feeling that's authentic. Because mm -hmm. there's always the you know, drugs to resort to, but that might not be quite what we're we're talking about right now. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I'm not advocating to do anything uh, that, that, that isn't actually genuinely fulfilling you and, you know, making you. Well, feel it's like shift the feeling with the outcome in mind, you know, what's the outcome, what's the outcome, because you're so laser focused, you act in such faith, you have such faith that creates such powerful action 
that I just think I love to talk to you. I'd love to have you on the show because you don't, it's like, you guys got to experience Daniel to know what we're talking about here. So kind. I think um, I'm, I, I feel like, I feel like I'm so, you know, multi-dimensional Jer. I, I, I constantly feel like, especially when I'm, you know, in situations like this where, you know, I hope that, you know, my, my perspective can lend some insight to folks who can really benefit from this, you know, uh, and, and maybe something I'm saying is resonating. Um, but, but I, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like some days I'm like, you know, a pit bull and I'm pounding my fists on the desk and I'm trying to ignite and, you know, and encourage people with a little bit more of that, like, you know, football coach, you know, grabbing the, the face mask on the helmet and pulling them close and saying like, you need to get your head in the game and get on the field and, 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 and like, get rid of this bullshit idea that you have in your head that everything has to be perfect. Just get out there and then throw, you know, and then there's this crosswind of, you know, being kind and empathetic. And I think that everything that I do, I, I try, I try my best. I'm a human, but I try to be empathetic. I try to do things with the, you know, intention in mind that I want to help people. I want to leave a good, um, you know, a good print on, you know, uh, a mark on, you know, whoever I'm with, whether it's, Hey, that guy was just really funny or like, you know, I really like that guy. You know, I, I am a, I, I, I do like it when people like me, you know, I, I, I do, I, I have to say, I have to admit, you know, and, and it makes me feel good. But, um, I think sometimes the self-talk that you can give yourself can be, um, you know, misleading when, uh, you're being a little too nice. And the advice that you really need to be giving yourself is, you know, put the bullshit excuses aside, go out and do the work, pay attention to your clients, invest more, take more risk, you know, just get out there and do the work. You know, I think that that's also self-love too. I think, you know, there, you're an interesting dichotomy because you see in this business that seems to be whatever we're doing, people will come into a market or you're, wherever you are in your business, right? But an easy exaggerated example is when you're coming in and that story when you talked about being new and people would say to you, well, it's going to take this, it's going to be, and you said, well, maybe that was for you, not for me. Now, there are a lot of people who come into a new industry or in a state and they think that, but then reality slaps them in the face and they find out that negative news was in fact true. For you, on the other end of that, when you go and pursue something, whatever it is, you see the big picture and you perhaps don't deny the feedback the world gives you when it's not working out, but rather than take that feedback as that bad news was true, that feedback is just feedback to overcome the next obstacle, to keep me on my mission, to get to my goal. I also have another saying, you're exactly right. And thank you for saying that because that, that, felt, that felt like uh, uh, I've been heard. But I have a, another saying that I, I, I say in my office all the time, which is that when we lose, we win. Mm. When we lose, we win. Because you know what? We know what not to do. We know how to shift. We know maybe we, we pick up a valuable lesson on something that we did or didn't do. You know, but but you know, again, back to belief systems and call it delusional. I don't care what you call it because it's my truth. But I well, it's working out <laughs> mantras. You know, these little mantras that I I've always said to myself. You know, when I feel like I'm getting punched in the mouth, you know, when something unfair has happened to me. And guys, I mean, look, I will tell you one thing about being at the top of the market, being young when you're entering in among the old guard established group of people who've been doing it for 30 to 40 years. Let me just tell you, everyone's real nice to you until you become a threat, all right? Until you start taking money out of their pocket. Then it's a different game. So I've experienced some foul play that is unbelievable, unbelievable. And I have to tell you, every single time, every time, that something has happened to me that I felt was devastating or how, oh my God, I have been rewarded on a silver platter with an unbelievable lesson or an opportunity or a an understanding that literally unlocked something new and has helped me. And that is my belief 
When we lose, we win. When we lose, we win. Search for the win and the loss. Search for the win and the loss. It is the mindset. It's the choice. What you focus on determines what you see. Absolutely. Focus on the win. Find the win. You can see, you know. You can't receive the win if you're not looking for it and willing to see it. Absolutely. Now, we talked about, you said something earlier and about, you know, I don't care what, um, what is it, political party? We, I don't know if you, you know, um, Thomas Wright, he ran for governor in Utah. He was a Republican. He was a big guy. I can't remember the seat he was in before he did that. And he worked side by side as a very devout Republican, very openly spoken, a very devout Democrat. That Democrat, I wish I could remember the names of their seats and with the state, but that Democrat hired him to list his house. Amazing. Right? Like, how powerful is that? Because he came to the table as who he was. And he said, if there's anybody I trust when you don't agree with me, that I can trust you to be honest with me and work from the other side of the table with me. Now, I pivot that to say how powerful, because you probably relate to other examples and you're not that it's politics, but I think that's an example for everybody to hear because politics has become kind of a point of everything for a lot of people recently. Well, when you're being hired on your merit and not your political affiliation or not your age or not your, not your, you know, wh- wh- whatever you've done in the past. I mean, when you're, wh- when you're being hired on the belief that you're the right woman or man for the job, there is nothing more affirming than that. And so you have to toss your hat in the ring. You have to get in the ring, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, there are so many people who, you know, have bowed out of putting their dukes up and going to fight for the value that they bring to the table. And in order to fight for the value that you bring to the table, you have to know it intimately. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's so important to be around people who are constantly doing the things that you aspire to do. You know, whether it's you're hosting their open houses or you're trying to get you know, a coffee with them or, you know, you're listening to their podcasts or whatever it is that you're doing. You, 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 you know, the, the greatest thing about the world is that we get to borrow all these ideas from millions of, of incredible people. You can borrow some energy from somebody. I mean, I'll tell you, there are times with certain clients where I feel like I am, I am like, I am becoming somebody else so that I can answer a question in the way that I know it needs to be articulately delivered to them in a way that I know that they can receive, Mm. you know, it's like, take the best and leave the rest. You can be inspired by listening to somebody who's a Democrat or a Republican without being a Democrat or a Republican. You know, you can listen to Joel Osteen and, and, and be like, Oh my God, like that was an unbelievable message what he just gave without taking any of the fundamental kooky whatever stuff with you it is yeah. possible it is possible to take from people that you disagree with things that are really good you right. know what is it saying to be able to separate it's valuable to understand how to separate the wheat from the chaff yep. in life right like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater you talked about difficult conversations and we kind of keep circling around that here you said, you know, whether I, I know I've got to have that difficult conversation. And then you talked about like really being able to, that, that is probably so underestimated in what we say, how it sounds here and how it's received and the small gesture, but huge impact and outlay of events afterwards. How have you navigated that? How do you have those difficult conversations? I look forward to them. I've, I've, I've decided that instead of feeling crippling anxiety Hmm. over the truth that needs to be spoken, that I look myself in the mirror and I feel as though, you know, the difficult conversations are frankly kind because sometimes you have to tell somebody that they don't belong on your team. Sometimes you have to tell somebody that their work ethic is not up to par. And while you like them individually as a person, they don't belong on your team. That's Mm -hmm. a difficult thing to have. That's a difficult conversation to have to have. It's also a difficult conversation to tell somebody, you know, that their home is grossly overpriced. 
it's difficult to tell somebody that their furniture is atrocious and that the paint color is wrong and that the market is not going to have a reaction to this or that, you know, I mean, look, so much of our, you know, effectiveness is owed to having these upfront conversations where, frankly, you know, we're speaking truth as an advisor to a prospective client so that they can have a great outcome on the market without pandering to them and and just nodding our head and doing what they want us to do. Sometimes as the, you know, the market leader, you have to politely disagree and in a in a way, you know, help that other client see the light. And hey, look, sometimes you only get so far, you know, and you have to know when to stop and you have to know, you know, when when to be, you know, an advocate. Um, you know, for your client and want to be aggressive with them and try a number. And hey, sometimes, you know, you put a house on the market that's, you know, more than what you would list it for and it sells. And oh my God, how awesome is that? Right. But I, I, I don't know. I look forward to having these kind of conversations because I know that it just helps me grow. And with every single difficult conversation that I have, I feel like, you know, Super Mario that like bounces up and down and with every coin he touches, like his power goes up, like I feel like I have so much power and I have gone through so many difficult conversations while I may be, you know, on the younger end of the spectrum, you know, keep in mind, I've been doing this for 10 years, selling upper bracket real estate. And I have sold a lot of real estate, you know, hundreds and hundreds of transactions at thousands probably by now. And so I've seen a thing or two. And I know that when you hit things head on, when you don't shy away from saying the advice that needs to be said, you know, that you can hold your head high and do the job that you came there to do. And look, you may not, it may not be the best conversation, but you'll be respected and you'll mm -hmm. respect yourself, which is the most important thing. Wow. It's like earlier you talked about, you know, there's these conversations you can have and complain. And sometimes the thought is, well, it's just us. Nobody's hearing us, but you're hearing it. Absolutely. And what does that create within yourself? What is the action? What are the habits? What is the outcome? It's all about the outcome, doing things with the end in mind. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's all choice, right? We get to choose everything. Now you've become an expert of these difficult conversations as you do it. Some of it, you probably learn intuitively. And I think a lot of it comes from two places, gratitude and empathy. Um, if you had to explain how to do it to somebody who wasn't, is there, you know, like a formula, like you come and first you meet them where they are, you make sure they feel heard. And then you let the conversation pivot. Um, that's Jerry Metcalf's formula. But, but, but like, as you think about how you approach these, have you found yourself, you've got to approach it with empathy. If you come and just tell somebody their, their living room's ugly, you might take pride in being honest, but the message isn't received and the outcome doesn't happen. How do you find, how have you personally found that path to doing that? It's just, it's, and you've done it in a way that you have an experience that you can look forward to. You know, I think there are varying degrees of difficult conversations to have. You know, it's one thing to tell somebody that they need to have, you know, their house staged and that, you know, they're, the, you know I know that they don't want to spend, you know, uh, additional capital to, to get it in its fighting shape, but it really, it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative. And that if they don't do it, they're going to be leaving money on the table. That's one kind of conversation, right? And then there are conversations that are a little bit more, you know, maybe made an error, right? Maybe, maybe the mailer didn't go out when you said it was going to go out or, you know, whatever, there's a typo in the listing description, or, you know, you left the client's, you know, mansion front door wide open. I don't know. I'm just pulling things out of my, you know, my hat right now. Um, but, you know, what you, what I always like to keep in mind is that it's not about me and that you need to go into these conversations knowing that you want to convey that the other side is being heard and that you understand, you may not agree with, but that you understand where they're coming from. You got to pull them close to you. If you want to get a point across, they have to level with you, you know? And, and so sometimes saying, listen, look, we have a, we have a client right now. Uh, 
I sold a house about four years ago in this developing neighborhood in Washington. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a, their first home and they work on Capitol Hill and it, you know, it was a ton of money for them at the time. And the neighborhood was just going up and up and up and up in values. And, you know, somewhat recently it's taken a turn for the worst and the crime is just horrible. You know, it's just, it, it, it's not what they expected. You know, we have the house on the market, you know, it's not selling, um, you know, they, they, they want to have a baby. They want to get into a different neighborhood, you know? You have to call these people and say, guys, I know that you do not, you know, you didn't intend for this to be the outcome. I know exactly what that must feel like. You know, you want to turn the page on this chapter. You want to have a baby. You want to get out to the suburbs. We want that for you. And you have to also understand a couple of things that are going on right now in the marketplace, right? You know, look, there are some issues with crime. You know, we're also in August. It's a notoriously slow time for our market, you know, but we will get this done. And I know that this is the most important thing to you. And trust me, we want to affirm, you know, our commitment to you that we're going to get this done and show them in a marketing sheet what we're doing to get it done and to constantly make sure that they're being heard, you know, when they're disappointed, you know, look, it, it just happens. It happens. And I, I, I think the people who dive right in, you know, uh, look, I had a conversation not too long ago with another uh, couple, a very good client of ours, actually, who's done multiple transactions with us. They bought a beautiful penthouse for me in the city, and I'm now listing their home in the suburbs. It's been on the market for a little while. They decided to list it, you know, strategically higher than what I recommended. And they're, you know, they. I got a text message while I was on vacation, um, you know, and of course, you know, I had a... I had a decision point, right? Do I get on the phone right now while I'm getting ready to sit by the pool at my friend's house in Nantucket, you know, um, and make this call and get on the phone with them and 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 try to you know button this up or say you know I'm out of town and I'll get back to you on Monday, you know? And I decided to take the former, and I got on the phone with them, and instead of saying, well, you know, I told you that the house should be listed you know, for $4 million, you know, and I know that you chose to, to list it at $4.5 million. I decided to say, look, you know, not every seller is, is going to be the same. We have clients that list our houses more aggressively and want to get the higher end of the market, but that what comes along with that is a level of patience because we know that the closer you are priced to the strike price, the higher the likelihood that the property is going to sell, you know, on the shorter end of the spectrum you know, below the average amount of days on market. And so, you know, I sat with them, I had a conversation, which was empathetic towards, you know, the decision that they made. They were looking at me, basically saying, why didn't you tell us more, you know, um, you know, with more, uh, you know, authority that that the house, you know, needed to be, you know, better priced. And I, I think I did a pretty good job, but it wasn't about me in that moment. Well, they, and things are always remembered differently, yeah. It wasn't about me saying, I told you so, and this is what we should have done. Where does that get anybody? It's not about being right. No, no. It's about leveling with them and saying, look, guys, I know that you're gut renovating, gut renovating a penthouse with, you know, a, a developer that's probably charging you an arm and a leg and you got a vacation house and you're holding a mortgage. And look, you know, I, I want to get this done for you. But now that we're in this position, look, I do not recommend that we cut the price right now because it's August. Let's wait until after Labor Day. I'm going to commit to reshooting, you know, to reshooting the virtual tour. We're going to do a night tour. We're going to, you know, we're going to revamp the copy. I'm going to totally relaunch it after Labor Day. Yeah. You know, like you, th that is what people need. They need to hear that the person that they're aligned with professionally is doing what needs to be done to get the job done. You know, and there are things that are outside of our control. And Jerry, you know this because you were a real estate agent for so many years. How many times does the broker get blamed for things that are totally beyond their control? Right? All the time. Right. All the, time. Like the easiest target. All the time. All the time. So, you know, I think I think you just, you know, look, you, every conversation is different. Uh, you know, there are ups and downs and you know, whether you're right or wrong, what's helpful in those moments is to just be you know, well, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier when someone hears you and someone shows you how hard they're working. 
it's a lot harder to blame that person when that when you have the experience and the conversation with that person that number one they're hearing you and they're here they're really hearing you and you know they're hearing you and they're making sure they hear you they don't think they hear you they're telling you what they hear and making sure they hear it and number two they see the action behind it that's huge they're not looking to be wrong so they can tell you you're right and give you authority that's not how it works <laughs> i don't know about you i don't know about you jerry but but you know i just mentioned to you that i like to be liked you know that the, we all other yeah, like, people's opinion be liked. Me, you know actually does matter to me you know inherently you know i'm i'm an empath that's I'm human. an empathic person I that empath too right and so and so the other thing that you have to learn to do i think i mean in in my perspective is you have to become a master at compartmentalizing parts of your life. Mm. You cannot, because even though it's not your fault that the house is still sitting on the market because of what they chose and what they chose to do in the moment when they were presented with other options, you st if you're a good person and you feel responsible for doing the right thing, you're gonna feel bad when somebody calls and they're not happy, you know? And you yeah. really make it right, but you have got to learn if you're going to be successful, if you're going to have a big business, if you're going to have a lot of things cooking at once, you got to learn how to compartmentalize things so that it doesn't bleed into your family life, doesn't bleed into, you know, other and, in your life. Well, one, one thing I'm hearing, I want to ask you a question to that too, though, is just the way it's so important to own our power and own our success, let other people do the same. And it doesn't mean to call them wrong. It means to let them call their shots, empathize with them and own what we bring to the table in that. Now, number two, for you, though, how do you really compartmentalize that? It's taken me a long, long time. I mean, like I said, I, I mean, look, I'm not I'm not uh, this like, you know. Uh, unreactive, non-emotional person. I think that that's what great, makes me great at my job is that I am highly emotional and I'm highly sensitive and that I can pick up nuances. You know, I, I like to talk to people on the phone. I like to see people. I like to have a full read on what's like going on. When you talk to people, do you have it? Because I've been told I'm an empath, but like I feel like I, my chest will tighten or I'll feel my throat. Like there are things I, I feel it in my body, what they're telling me. Jer, I can tell you without, you know, any doubt in my mind that, you know, the nervous system is really the most perce perceptive thing. You know, I mean, if your nervous system is telling you something about someone, chances are it's right. And I can tell you, you know, I, I, I've tried to hone that skill over the years. It's led me to a lot of success. It's led me to stay away from a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, danger, you know, things that I, you know, shouldn't be involved in. Um, you know, and, and, and what's great is that, you know, listening to my gut, uh, has empowered, you know, a lot of the decisions that I've made, because even, you know, members of my teams tell me all the time, Daniel, I, I trust your gut. I trust your gut. You, you, I trust your, I mean, like, you know, I, I feel like I know things before I even know them sometimes mm -hmm. very weird to say, but I, I, I do, um, you know, and I guess when you're constantly negotiating and trying to pick up on subtle nuances to, um, you know, to get a job done, I guess it's maybe something that comes along with the territory. Um, well, you said it comes along with the territory, but a lot of people will try to turn that off to be able to deal with it. And that just creates this tension. I think it takes time. It's think, power. Well, you dialed into it. It sounds like rather than turning that off, you recognize the power that's in it and you actually dial into it and find where it serves you. You just can't let you, you can't let things that are beyond your control destroy you and hijack your mental clarity and hijack the, you know, the point that you attract absolutely everything from, which is your feelings and your mindset. You just cannot. And, you know, and that's what I mean by by David and Goliath. There's another example, right? Like that's a David moment where I'm like pounding my fist saying like, I'm not letting this get, no, I'm not letting this get the best of me. Like I'm going for a run. I'm going to the beach. I'm booking a vacation right now. I'm going to get something on my calendar. I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to take a hundred dollar bill 
out of my wallet and roll down my window and give it to somebody who's standing on the street that's begging. Have you actually me. done that? Oh, you actually- oh my God, absolutely. Let me tell you what, that's a, ch- that, that, you know, people are always talking about hacks. Let me give you a happiness hack. Go and give, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred dollars. Go give a $20 bill to somebody who's on the street. That is instant vibration upliftment. That is instantaneous. We're doing a good thing. And it doesn't have to be to somebody on the street. Maybe it can be to your church. Maybe it can be, you know, you calling somebody that's junior to you in your office and saying, wow, I just saw that you got that unbelievable listing. Congratulations. We're watching you. You're doing a great job, you know, because people have done that to me, you know, and so it makes you feel good. And so that's, that's, that, that's what you got to seek out. You got to, you got to seek out that constant feeling of fulfillment. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. All right. So, um, Tell us a little, and then we're going to do the final three that we always do because it's always different. Um, but before we do the final three questions, tell us a little bit about this other listing that you've gotten, the Blaine Mansion. This is really, so give us just some fun. Like, tell us the story, tell it whatever we need to know because it's a fun story. Whatever. Well, the Blaine Mansion uh, was constructed in the late 1800s, you know, in downtown Washington. Uh, DuPont Circle used to really be the nucleus of the city. And it's where all of the big, you know, robber baron tycoons built their great family estates. If you were wealthy in America and wanted to assert power in Washington, you built a home on DuPont Circle or, you know, close by. Um, and, and you know, that was kind of your, you know, your, your shrine to your yeah. success and power and influence. Right. So, you know, that's why when you come to Washington, you go down to Embassy Row, all those beautiful mansions. They were once owned by prominent families from all over, you know, uh, the country who came to Washington. And this specific mansion is the last freestanding Gilded Age mansion on DuPont Circle. Never in its 200 years plus years um, has it ever been offered to the market. It's always traded hands privately. And, um, you know, I'll tell you in in keeping with you know what I told you about kind of my mindset uh you know how I feel like things are always kind of conspiring to bring me great luck and to present opportunities I got this Instagram DM from this uh commercial real estate agent who I hadn't heard of weeks Daniel, like, I know you don't know me, but I got to get you, I got to get you over here to look at this place. I I, I met this guy at the farmer's market and, you know, I I want you to come and see this listing. And I I was like, okay. So I I, I went out um, and at the time I had a big embassy client that was looking for, uh, you know, a a new, a new home uh, for their embassy. And I saw it and I said, oh my God, like, do not tell anybody about this. And um, I ended up bringing that client through, you know, secret service came, it was the big, 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 you know, deal showing. And, um, and that's how I met the sellers and it was pure luck, pure luck. Um, and you know, so while I meet with the, the sellers who are VVVIP, um, you know, I started talking about kind of, you know, they were interviewing agents. Oh, did different- you know that I did. Okay. Um, but this and, is for this property that you listed, right? Same property. Okay. And so, you know, look, uh, it's the most expensive listing that's ever hit the market in Washington. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't tell us about they were, you were having the conversation with them. You yeah, met so, them at the showing. So tell us about that conversation. Yeah. So the conversation was, you know, uh, the, the, the tried and true, you know, so why you, you know, why you? Why should we entertain you? You know, and and look, I'm not I'm not so, you know, uh, self important to think that everybody in the upper bracket of the market should know who I am. You know, I always approach every listing like, you know, hey, I'm Daniel Hyder. It's so nice to meet you. Let me tell you about my team. Let me tell you about what we do. You know, um, and so you know, our office happens to be a block down the street. I had them in. Uh, you know, I I pulled together a phenomenal presentation, um, you know, uh, without going into, you know, the, the, the full contents of the, of the, of the meeting, you know, I thought that they felt that it was impressive. Um, you know, we pulled together a campaign and it's now on the market and, 
you know, it's the most expensive listing that's ever hit the market in Washington, probably one of the most important listings ever. Um, and, you know, what's look, the price on this one? This is the 29.95. So okay. um, and, you know, look, uh, things are always working out for me. What can I say, Jerry? They just are. They just, they just keep working out for you, right? Yeah. Might have a lot to do with the mindset and the action that it creates, perhaps. And they will continue to keep working out for me, no matter what happens. No matter what happens, they are going to continue to work out for me because I am the person that's responsible for the life that's manifesting in front of my eyes every day. What are we going beyond? And then I'm, I'm going to ask you final three questions, but mindset is everything your state of mind determines the action you take mindset's number one what's number two um taking care of of people mm. you know taking care of people being generous um, generosity doesn't have to necessarily mean that you're generous with money although that's something that is you know, I think when you're, when you're generous, I've found that when you're generous with people on your staff, with your clients, you know, with the abundance mentality that you preach to yourself and in your inner dialogue, um, that it's a testament to you being the person that's in charge of creating the life that's happening in front of you every day, you know, and I think the more generous you are, you know, the more faith you're demonstrating to yourself that more is on its way than that, you know, that you're creating great greatness, whether it's with a staff or it's breeding another opportunity or it's whatever, whatever it is, you know, I, I think that you, you, you have to be generous of the pocketbook and you have to be generous of spirit and you have to be generous. Yeah. generous to make people laugh, generous with your compliments, generous with a smile, you know, generous, you know, you just have to be a generous person. Yeah. So true. And what that, I think when you say that is two things about you, number one is you deliver on your promises and number two, you do it with gratitude. I'd like to think I, I do. I try, I try to be cognizant of it, you know, and, and I'll tell you some of the times where I'm the most frustrated with myself is when I feel that I should have or could have reacted in a different way more so internally than outwardly, you know, that I let something hijack my mind, that I let that client get the best of me, that I let that other agent say something that, and that, that affected me, that I let that, it, I, I am becoming stronger every day, you know, and these little experiences and lessons that, you know, play out in front of me, um, you know, I choose to let them help me and assist me. In, and hopefully, you know, living a better life and just feeling yeah. better. Wow, that is just so powerful. Final three. Number one, as we look at all of this, what would you say is the most powerful tool you've had to create your success? Um, developing my team. Developing and, wow. So we should have talked more about that because a big one I heard in there was creating the mindset, having the team with the right mindset and the accountability. What else? You know, um, getting, yeah, I mean, I, this ties into developing a team, but having a leverage on, on my time, you know, uh, I've learned that all of the risks that I've taken along the way have been to, you know, give me a lever on my time because our time is the most important thing in the world. You know, I, I really, you know, I, I try not to, you know, half-ass things. I don't like the half-ass emails. I don't like the half-ass text messages. I don't like the half-ass, the podcast that I'm on right now. You know, I really try to dig for things that are, valuable when I'm alert and on and, and ready to give my best version, you know, of, of, of what I'm trying to, you know, impart. Um, and, and so, you know, having a lever on your time 
allows you to be a little bit more creative. It allows you to not be, you know, so bombarded and overwhelmed with the things that you have to accomplish. But, you know, when you, when you set, like, for instance, when I set up my logistics team, my contracts to close, you know, um, my operations manager, my team manager, you know, my, my CMO, I set them up under my fundamentals, under my level of quality with the expectations that I've, you know, brought into this business, but I've given them autonomy to run the show and which has given me an unbelievable leverage on my time so that I can be focused where our clients really need us to be focused, you know, and where my team needs me to be focused. Um, so having a leverage on my time, you know, is huge. Leveraging your time and setting a team up for success in a way that they know the expectations, they have the resources to know what the expectations are to fulfill, and they can also have the autonomy to deliver it to the best of their ability, which is going to be better than what you could probably come up with for them. Um, I can't not ask because I could just hear people wanting to know this. What is the do you create action steps? What do you, what is, what is the best resource for accountability? Is it using something like Asana? Is it having them do it? Is it, are there tools or communication? I think having clear expectations of, of what the quality standard is and being, you know, being very hands-on, you know, I mean, there, you know, I just spoke about having a leverage on my time. The whole point of developing a team is so that you can accomplish more together and you can create you can do a better job you can create the you know henry ford assembly line of selling luxury real estate in a premium manner you know i mean it's like i think that there's this notion from a lot of people that you know if you start a team you're deluding yourself and that that you know people are going to want and to an extent of course you know, our clients expect Daniel Hyder specifically to be on certain calls and to be handling certain things. But that's like saying that you expect to go to, you know, uh, a famous uh, a Wolfgang Puck restaurant and have Wolfgang Puck cook every single meal that comes out of the kitchen. It's just not possible. It's not possible. Wolfgang is not cooking your omelet today, Susan. Sorry. Wolfgang no. also has the chef prepare them to a certain standard of quality. And there's the point. What Wolfgang did is he said, I'm going to hire you, Jean-Pierre, who's going to be my chef de cuisine here. And we're going to develop this menu together. I'm going to taste everything. I'm going to show you what my quality is. You're going to stage under me. You're going to learn under me. You're going to get my methodology, my mentality. You're going to see what my standard is. You're going to operate it like this. You're going to execute like this and you're going to run with it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out, I'm going to open another restaurant and I'm going to implore this team to operate under my standards so that we all can benefit from what's happening here because it's a it's a codependent ecosystem. And really, when I think to your point, and that was where before most of you know, not everybody knows I'm coaching now. And it's, I've been not selling for over a year and a half. But one of my big things I'd always I wanted to coach, but I was not going, I was, here's my thing to this point, until I really understand this team thing, because through the years of interviewing people on podcasts, I've found that one thing that's missing is a real understanding of how to do it well when it comes to luxury. And to your point, and at the end of my career, when my clients were calling me saying to me, you have an amazing team and the referrals where you've got to work with her and that team, there's nobody like them. That's when you know, because every agent can be them, but if they have to do everything, they can't do a great job. But if you've got the agent who's got the best team, you've got the agent who's giving you their best and other people who are giving more of the best, you can't get better than that. No. And listen, you know, back to, back to risk for a minute, like, you know, I, I'm, I'll be the first person to tell you that, look, guys, it is hard to develop a team like I have. But why should it be any different? Why should it be easy? There's a reason, there's a reason why there's so few people 
that <laughs> are, are, you know, are, are doing certain things, right? Because it is hard, because there is a barrier to work ethic and there is a, only a finite amount of hours in a day. And guess what, guys? If you have a family, if you have other important things in your life, it's gonna be harder for you to get things done. Thank God I started when I was really young and didn't have all of those responsibilities. I mean, trust me, I am. So, I think about that all the time. If I had started right now versus when I started at 24 years old, my my business would be different, right? Yeah. And so I, you, you, it's like it's like you know how they talk about investing in the stock market when you're really young. Like that's another train I missed, right? I should have taken all that money that I made early on in my career and you know put it in the stock market or bought a, bought a bought a piece of real estate, right? Because look at what would it, it would have done. It matures. Well, I'll tell you the investment that you make in your team. It, it, it's all about time. And if you're pouring into a marketing person and trying to teach them everything, that's going to take a year or years of your time to get them in the place where they are autonomous. And that's going to take a year or years of your time to do that with your contract coordinator and to do that with your sales advisors. And so it takes time. But, you know, look, that's just it, right? I mean, we choose to be successful not because it's you know it's 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 hard or it's easy but because of at the end of the day what it has netted me is an is a life that i'm so proud of you know mm -hmm. relationships that are unbelievable and and so i'd rather work my ass off and keep investing in that apparatus that continues to show me the greatest fruits of life um you know, relation relationally and monetarily and, you know, business wise and, you know, my, my own sort of, uh, physicality has been impacted by real estate. I mean, truly, I mean, I, I, I had a big wake up call a couple of, you know, about a year ago where, you know, I really needed to get my ass in shape and how in the world am I going to be the world's best real estate agent? If I'm, you know, if I'm, eating junk food and staying up late and, 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 you know, not feeling, you know, incredible wearing the suits that I like to wear and, you know, giving the energy that I want to give real estate, my job and my aspirations to be the best at what I do forced me to get into better shape. Yeah. You know, I, I think this is a magical career path. You can do great things if you let it be you know, your guiding life. You look at real estate in a way that it is not just about making a transaction, but it's the people that you meet. It's the journey. It's the big life that you get to experience. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the wins, it's the losses, it's everything in between. It's the training, it's the failure. It's all of those things, you know, but, but as you get a little bit older and, and the team matures and hopefully you wise up as you get a little bit older and you've had a few things under your belt, you've had a couple things fall apart. You've had a couple people, you know, get fired. You've had a couple people, you know, uh, quit, you, you know, you've had all these things happen. You know, I will tell you, it doesn't get easier, but it definitely is more manageable because you've seen that before and you know, yeah. Well, and look at the person. No, go ahead. Finish. What, what was that sentence you were just saying? You said, you know. You just, you know, I, I feel like, you know, nothing is devastating anymore. Yeah, so true, right? No, so true. It's not. Well, and to that point, it's, I don't remember who said this, but it's through, our business is a tool through which we evolve as people. Like the evolution of you as a person and the lessons you've learned have given you a source of such fulfillment and happiness that it's ironic how people might think you do it for the money, but it's that evolution as a person that, cult that yes, that cultivates the income, but what it really does is evolve you as a grow you as a person. Oh my God, absolutely. Look, to, to me, it is all about freedom. <sighs> I love freedom. I love to choose. I love to choose. I love to decide, you know, how I'm going to spend my time. I love to be the person that, you know, uh, is able to lend money. 
I love to be the person that people come to when they have an idea that they want to share and they want to run it by me first to think that you know, to, before they they test it. You know, I, I love that. I love that. Freedom is is really the thing that I'm after. The money is great. And money certainly, you know, is attached to freedom in a lot of ways. But I am obsessed with the freedom that it gives me. You know, it's so huge about that. So I've studied a lot of neurolinguistic psychology before I came into coaching and being in coaching. And the most powerful, and we actually have an awesome interview. Um, it will either have played right before or after yours with Damon Cart. I've never heard anybody speak to it so well. But the core of it all is understanding that most people don't know what they value. You know, like, you know, like, this is what this is for. Like, at the end of the day, whatever shifts in my world, there is one thing, there is an aim, there is a priority, it is freedom. Yes. Freedom feels really good. Mm -hmm. It feels really good. You know what? I'll tell you, um, I decided there was a big listing in McLean um, that reached out to me. It had been on the market for a while. Um, I'm not going to get into specific names of, but, 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 you know, this, this developer that reached out, I went out to the property, you know, it would have been a big paycheck, but I decided that we just did not align. I don't mm -hmm. know if I could have represented them with full, um, you know, with, 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 with the way that we like to represent our clients. And, you know, I had the freedom to send an email last night and say, thank you so much for your consideration, but we are fully committed right now for the fall. And I, I must owe my clients, you know, the attention that they've signed up for. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be following you. And if I have a buyer, you know, I'd love to bring them through and, you know, thank them graciously and bowed out. But let me tell you that to me is freedom. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> Or like, you know, I, I, I am not going to put myself in this position uh, to feel any less than what I know I'm worth. No. That's amazing. And that, that's like right back to like when you just, when you know that and you can serve that and live by that, it's everything. Question number two of the final three, book. If there's one we've got to read right now, making an impact, could make an impact, would, what is it? My favorite book, it's How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. You know, and, and you know, the novelty of like the old expressions, you know, the, built, the, the book was built, it was, was, you know, written a long, long time ago. And I, I love audiobooks, and I love to hear, um, you know, this is audible. Oh, yes. And I think, is it Napoleon Hill that's reading it? Or right? love, and, 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 you know, so here's the deal. Here's the moral of the story, right? Always make the other person feel important. Mm. That's it. Because people have a fundamental void where they need to be felt they need to be seen. They need to be heard. They want to be, you know, validated. They want to feel important. And if you can keep that principle alive every day and at the forefront of your mind when you're doing business and when you're in, you know, at your everyday relationships, husband and wife, boyfriend, even, whatever. Well, even when you turn down business, Daniel, you made sure they felt important. Absolutely. I mean, listen, it, it may not be right for me, but who am I to judge? You know, who am I to, I'm not, I, I, I just felt it was that, you know, Jared, it was that gut feeling. I didn't know exactly why, but I knew exactly why. And I had to trust it. And I just got that. Mm, 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 mm. Nope. I love what you said too. You said the nervous system, I forgot your wording, but about how powerful and intuitive it is and to, and you know, as someone, an empath, a lot of people, I think, try to turn that off and it just makes it more. I mean, whether it's neurolinguistic psychologists or therapists or psychiatrists or whatever they all say, they always have a different version of it and they call it different things. But there's this, I don't know if you've seen the Netflix, um, Lutz, is it? He even talks about this. He calls it your shadow. But he's like, whatever that is, you've got to welcome it. It's serving a purpose. And the more you try to push, the more it comes and then that turns into self-sabotage. Just something really powerful there that you've brought back to this conversation today. Um, 
important, you know, people, people speak with not just their words. Oh, and you hear with not just your ears. I mean, what do I look like now? <laughs> oh my God. Like we could have a whole hour interview on that. Meanwhile, it's just, it's just, it's communication. It's communication, you know? And I, I don't know if it's, a, if it was like a, a subconscious survival thing that I adopted as a child, you know, cause I moved around a lot, but mm. I tell you, I pick up on subtleties, you know? And I have, I have my hunch about things and it is deadly accurate. Wow. Are you, and when you listen to it, hone it. Yeah. It probably helps. Yeah. Yeah. If there is, this is the last question, which I hate to end this because you're just so great to listen to and to talk to and so inspiring. Um, if there's one thing that you hope we remember as if we're going to forget everything on the call today, but one, but if there were going to only be one thing that everybody listening takes away, what do you hope that that is? To constantly focus on the way that you feel. As simple as that sounds, to just constantly make sure that you feel that you feel good. Mm -hmm. Whether that is listening to music or calling the clients or doing the work, you know, I don't know. I, I get feelings of accomplishment and feeling good when I do things that I know I need to do. You know, and I think that we all have that voice that tells us what we need to do. I think we get into trouble when we don't listen to that voice. And so I think being true to yourself is, is, is actually listening to that inner voice that you have that is telling you every single thing that you need to be doing. You know, if it strikes a chord, if it gives you goosebumps on your arm, if it, you know, if it perks you up, if it opens your eyes a little bit wider, if it, you know lifts you to a place where you're feeling a greater sense of whatever motivation or love or gratitude or whatever it is, that's what you should focus on. And then everything else falls into place. You know, so then I hear, well, let you might drop that, but I can't because one thing I hear is in your whole world and life and everything that you do is listen intently to what's around you. Yeah. And sometimes the listening doesn't come until <laughs> it's in the rear view mirror, <laughs> you know, I mean, my God, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I'm some like, you know, burning bush. I am not, i I'm just giving you my own unique life experience and the things that I've felt and that I know to be truth. You know, that that's all I can ever give you. That's all anybody can ever give you, you know? And so, you know, yeah, I mean, listening intently, you know, you can use the index of all of your life experiences to listen, you know, maybe something I've said on this podcast to somebody, you know, brings up a moment where, you know, Folks didn't even realize that there was a lesson in something that was said. And this recalls a memory that helps them listen to the truth for a little bit. You know, you never know. The world is a magical place where, you know, if you're seeking inspiration, if you're seeking, you know, good things to come your way, they'll show up in all the most unexpected places. Wow. So true and so powerful. Daniel, you're amazing. Thank you so much for coming back on. And because it's actually been a while since we've had you on. So it's just really nice to see you and good to have you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for, for giving me this, this uh, platform. You know, we've been friends for a while. It's nice to, to watch you do your thing. I'm always a fan. And uh, you guys are very lucky to have this one as your coach. I'll tell Thank you that. You. And it's good to see you. Thank you.